welcome back. So today we have a special treat from Carrie and Ivar. As some of you know, uh, Ivar got a little bit injured. I think it was something he was dealing with for a very long time. And we finally found that he's got a low grade bone bruise in his ankle. And so he's been on hand walking detail as well as thank goodness we've still been able to turn him out, which is really important to me. So Carrie's had her hands full of teaching Ivar some, yeah, I mean, just stress coping skills. Um, Ivar is very sight sensitive. He's very noise sensitive. His first reaction is to stand straight up on his hind legs if he feels insecure in a situation. So as you can imagine, hand walking has been a little bit difficult. Um, and it's important for injuries, you know, we have to be able to make sure we can walk the horse as much as possible. Um, I really feel like horses cannot walk enough. Um, and I love good old fashioned hand walking over machinery because it just like freaks me out. You know, metal and horses just, you know, I like it the old fashioned way, which is puts a lot of steps on your iPhone, but uh, keeps the horses a little bit more healthy. And why not just build our connection every day we get a chance to. So Carrie, you might want to just mention a little bit like an introduction to what you've worked through with Ivar and just, you know, he's nine years old. Um, he's a fantastic, talented horse. He's an Everdale Jazz. We have high hopes for him. It's not a career ending injury by any means. So it's important to get this therapy, um, give him as much time as he needs and yeah, that he can heal and come back and be the best 12 year old I've ever had in my life. So that's, <laughs> that's our hope. But um, at the end of the day, it's really hard to see a horse in stress. And so Carrie has been super helpful. Carrie is very educated in natural horsemanship. Um, and we can talk about that in a whole nother, probably in the, her bio. Um, but she can just tell us a little bit about some of the challenges that Ivar faces. Yeah, so um, Ivar is super sensitive. Like you mentioned, light, sound, noise really anything. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about the light spots on the yeah. ground. Doesn't like that either. <laughs> yeah, just anything really. Um, and my main goal with the groundwork with him is to quietly show him that he's going to be able to think before we react to stimuli. Um, because yeah, when he reacts, he just goes straight up. It's kind not of comes super out fun. of nowhere. And you know um, me, I never say anything comes out of nowhere. <laughs> but it really is like walking, I'm getting stressed, Wah! you know. Yeah, and so I joke that I want him to feel like he doesn't have to shout at me at a 10. He can let me know before we're standing on our high legs that something's going on, that he's getting upset, that he's getting nervous about something. Um, and then I'll listen. And that, you know, we're going to try to show him that there's going to be times where he's under pressure, but he doesn't have to react super negatively and that he can kind of listen and trust that I'm going to keep him safe and that he's fine. Um, and that there's some boundaries that we're going to function in and he's going to be happy in them. I yeah. think a big conversation that Carrie and I talk about a lot is the acceptance of pressure. Yeah. I think Ivar grew up in a program where it's a little bit what we talk about in the learned helplessness, where he really didn't come to the self-carriage on his own. He was a little bit, um, not forced in a bad way, right? But like very much like you need to do it this way. This is the only way I will put you on the bit and I will ride you really forward and I will run you past and over the things you're afraid of. And I feel like Ivar has never been taught that he has a voice. And so therefore, when he does speak, it's like screaming and just like, bah! you know, like there's no like, hey, I'm a little nervous about that. Should I be afraid? Like he doesn't ask the rider or the handler questions about that. He just kind of has no coping skills. And I feel like it just goes from like one to 10, you know, uh, really quickly, especially in hand. And so going into different arenas, not, not great for him. Um, changing locations, not great for him. Uh, he definitely has a very small bubble of like what's acceptable. Um, and even under saddle, that translates to being able to put your, uh, to close him from the hind leg to the bit. Um, that's a big challenge for him to accept 
um, both pressure from the hind legs and a soft um, isometric resistance in front. He doesn't really know how to feel and react to the isometric resistance. He even feels that's too much pressure. So welcome to our journey with Ivar <laughs> and we hope you enjoy it. Yeah. Make it a great day, guys. Hi guys. So this is Ivar and today we're just gonna do a super brief equipment introduction, working with a rope halter, how it should fit, how we're gonna tie the knot, what about the line? There's lots of questions if you've never kind of worked with this equipment before and there's definitely some stuff that you should know. So starting with the rope halter itself, there's gonna be lots of different options, um, lots of different nose bands. This is a good basic training for knot rope halter and it's gonna be important that your nose band sits right below the cheek bone, just like a bridle nose band one. And we're gonna want this one, these outer knots sitting right below, and then these two knots right on either bridge, right across the little fat, flat part of their face. So the actual nose loop itself, you don't want this so tight that there's no gap between, but you also don't want it so loose that it's just gonna be rocking and rolling on their face when you're working with them, because that's gonna give them some rubs. So you want it just enough that you can apply some pressure and ask him to back up and it's not gonna just rock and roll across his face. You're gonna adjust the height of this nose band with this little string right here to this knot. And we're gonna kind of show this here. So it's important that this knot is tied correctly because if it's not, it will come undone while you're working with them, which would not be optimal. <laughs> so when you're coming in, I'll show this knot. Can you see on the video? Perfect. So we're going to start with it away. Bring it under and around. Now we're going to make our loop and pull through. So when you're done, the tail should be pointed towards their tail, and it should be on top and not the bottom. Now, no matter how hard I pull on this, it's not gonna come undone. It's actually gonna tighten with the more pressure you put on it, but then super easy to undo. When we're ready to undo it, we're just gonna push it together, and then the knot comes undone right away. Perfect, okay. So, Last piece is going to be your line. Some rope halters are going to come with the line connected. Some might have a clip. These two I bought individually and then put together with a little half hitch. Looks like a figure eight when you're putting it on. That might just be a separate video because I don't want to let it completely go. Um, this is, I believe, a 14 foot line. Um, I think that that's probably a really good length. I wouldn't want to go too much longer because then you're going to have a bunch of coils in your hand. The more coils you're holding, there's more opportunities for the rope to get wrapped up in your hands. But I also wouldn't want it any shorter because we'll talk about this with positioning on the circles, but I don't want to be in the kicking zone. So I need the rope to be long enough that I can be in a safe position and not so long that I have so many coils in my hands that I'm at risk of getting myself wrapped up in it. Can I have that? Thank you. All right, so that's gonna be our rope holder. <laughs> Hi, it's Carrie again, back with a VAR, and we're gonna go over some basic safety while you're working with your rope halter. So the first thing that you wanna make sure, just to reiterate, is that we have our tail facing, tail of our knot facing the tail of our horse. We have an appropriate length line. This one is about 14 feet, and we have a properly fitted rope halter, so we're good to go. So. With a VAR, because he has the tendency to go up when he gets overwhelmed, we're gonna make sure that we're constantly kind of keeping our space. I can totally go in, love on him, tell him he's super, but it's important to me that when I step away and I reclaim my ground, that I have my space and he has his. And as you can see, he's practiced this a bit. So he's comfy, just kind of hanging out a little ways away from me. And I'm gonna make sure that even when I'm moving, 
that when I stop, we have an appropriate distance. Here I'm going to back him up. Notice how I'm not walking any closer to him when I'm asking him to back up because I don't want to be here, apply pressure, and have this horse rear, strike, whatever, towards me. So I'm going to make sure that if I ever ask him to back up at this stage, that I'm keeping my space, I'm going to back up and now ask him to back up. And I'm keeping my space between us. So that's going to be important when you're asking a horse that has a tendency to rear to back up. And even a horse that doesn't have a tendency, safety is always important. So next thing we're going to talk about is the spacing when we're working on a circle. So I'm just going to send a VAR out on a circle here real quick. Good boy. I always want to make sure that my feet are moving and that I'm stepping towards his shoulder. That's going to help me create kind of this bending arc. It's also going to help me keep myself in a safe position. So I am walking in the driving area. Imagine if there was a line right from his withers to the ground. That's going to be your balance point. Any energy behind the balance point is going to drive your horse forward. Any energy in front is going to stop. So, for instance, if I got too far in front, now he's going to get confused. He's like, whoa, that's not the driving spot, and he's going to stop. Super good boy. Going to send him out again. Good boy. I'm walking forward. Reason why we want to keep walking forward is because if we started to walk backwards and we had our horse walking in towards us, in towards us, in towards us, now he's claiming space and he's pushing me. So that's the opposite that we want. I want to move him. In that situation, he would be moving me. So we're going to step him back out. Good boy. I always make sure that I have his head tilted to the inside because if a horse was to kick, they're not going to be able to kick with their inside leg if their head is bent to the inside. So when you're working with a horse that maybe is a little younger, greener, spicier, whatever, the prerequisite to them kicking in at you is always going to be that head going to the outside because they got to bend to throw that leg in. So I'm going to make sure that I have his nose tipped to the inside at all time. Notice though that I don't have to tip his nose to the inside by holding the rope like this and being like, keep your head in here, keep your head in here, because it's his responsibility to keep the shape of this circle. So I might give a little correction, but I want to make sure that I'm not just holding him on this circle. Here I'm going to ask him to turn in. Good boy, Avar is going to keep his space. I gave a little correction there just to be like, no, that's good. I like this much room because we're all about just maintaining some nice safety between our horse and handler. <laughs> All right, good boy, Var. So that's it as far as safety and positioning.